Ryland, your article is about how money gets created. We're surrounded here by gold in the vaults of the Bank of England, and historically in the gold standard, the amount of gold would have been related to the stock of money in the economy. Things are very different now. In the modern economy, where does money come from? Well, let's start off with narrow or central bank money. As the name suggests, central bank money is determined by the Bank of England and consists of notes and reserves. And in normal times, at least, notes and reserves are determined by the amount of notes that people want, people want to hold or need for their transactions and the amount of notes and reserves that banks want to hold given the level of interest rates in the economy. It is not chosen or fixed by the central bank as is sometimes described in some economics textbooks. Your article focuses on broad money. What determines how much of that there is? Well, broad money, which in many ways is a better measure of the amount of money circulating in the economy, includes all the bank deposits of households and companies and one of the key points of the article is that banks create additional broad money whenever they make a loan. Now while this is nothing new, it is sometimes overlooked as the main way in which money is created. And it runs contrary to the view sometimes put forward that banks can only lend out deposits that they already have. In fact, loans create deposits, not the other way around. Now your article explains in more detail how lending creates money. It also explains how there are limits to how much banks are likely to create new money as a result of lending. These could be profitability considerations of the banks themselves, through to how households and companies react, in aggregate, to having increased deposits as a result of higher lending. That's right. So if banks create money through lending, what then is the role of the monetary policy of the central bank in this story? Well, you mentioned some of the limits to how much banks will lend in practice. Well, monetary policy provides the ultimate limit. Now, in normal times, say before the Great Recession, monetary policy is set through interest rates, and that determines the loan rates that are faced by borrowers in the economy and the amount of interest that banks pay out to depositors. And this directly affects the amount of lending that goes on in the economy and the amount of broad money that's created as a result. So obviously that's normal times. In the wake of the Great Recession, we've seen bank rate reduced to close to zero, and the Monetary Policy Committee embark on a series of asset purchases, often referred to as quantitative easing, or QE, to stimulate the economy further. Now, your article discusses a number of myths relating to how QE affects the money supply. Now, QE serves to increase the number of reserves that commercial banks hold at the central bank. But the first myth you discuss is the idea that this in some sense represents free money for banks. What's wrong with that account? Well, it's true, as you say, that QE will lead to an increase in the reserves that banks hold with the, with the Bank of England. But if you consider what's going on on the balance sheets of the parties involved, you can see that it's not really free money. The main point is that QE mainly involves buying government bonds from pension funds and other asset managers, not from banks. The pension fund in this example will receive money in their bank accounts, shown here in red, in exchange for those government bonds, shown in purple. The banks simply act as an intermediary to facilitate this transaction between the central bank and the pension fund. The additional reserves shown in green are simply a byproduct of this transaction. Now, while banks do earn interest on the newly created reserves, the key point is that QE also creates an accompanying liability for the bank in the form of the pension fund's deposit, which the bank will itself pay interest on. In other words, QE leaves banks with both a new IOU from the Bank of England, but also a matching IOU to consumers, in this case the pension fund. So in that sense, it's not really free money. Also starting from the fact that QE increases reserves, the second myth that you discuss is the idea that these reserves are then multiplied up into additional loans, and this is what gets the economy going. Indeed, this is the essence of the so-called money multiplier theory of monetary policy and how that stimulates the economy, found in many economics textbooks. How is this account misleading? Well, it's true, as we've discussed, that QE will lead to additional reserves held by the banking system. But banks cannot lend those reserves directly to households and companies. They have to make additional loans and matching deposits. And the simple fact of banks having more reserves will not materially affect their incentives to make lots and lots of additional loans to households and companies in the way the money multiplier mechanism that you mentioned would suggest. So how does QE affect the economy? QE affects the economy mainly through the extra bank deposits that pension funds and other asset managers end up holding. Those asset managers will use those deposits to buy higher, higher yielding assets, such as the bonds and equities that companies issue. That will raise the value of those assets and lower the cost to companies of borrowing using those instruments. That's the key way in which spending in the economy is affected. But that could also mean that QE might reduce bank borrowing if companies use some of the funds raised by issuing bonds and equities to repay some of their bank loans.